Welcome to Journey into the Word with J.P. Olson. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. I want to welcome you here today for my Just Passing Through, my Just Passing Through segment of Journey into the Word. Uh, God is good all the time, and I'm so blessed that you all have just have joined me today on this Wednesday. Let me get this camera right. On um, this Wednesday, uh, welcome, Geraldine. Welcome others who are joining me today uh, for my just passing through. I want to thank you if you're joining for the first time, that you will um, be inspired. The word, the message on Wednesdays are words of inspiration to inspire you to get through the week. So we, um, we know that it's, this is the middle of the week. So I want to share words of encouragement to inspire you to, uh, to get through this week. Midweek, midweek sometimes gets so tough. And, uh, and so it's sometimes a struggle to get through it. And as I mentioned, sometimes people call it back in the day hump day. If you can get over that hump to the end of the week. And so we're approaching the weekend. So we want to thank you. Uh, let's stay connected. As If you're here for the first time again, let's stay connected. We want you to uh, just stay connected with us. And we have means of that by all of our social media platforms. Hi, Wendy from South Africa. Uh, great to see you here. And, and hi, Kevin. Uh, I think that's how I have it right, Kevin. So it's welcome. If you're here for the first time, please let us know where you're joining us from, what nation, what country. Hi, Devon from Tennessee. Um, hi, uh, yes, uh, let us know what nation you're joining us from, uh, what country, what state. So that we love to acknowledge you. We want to welcome you into the family. We are journeying to the word ministry. We're non-denominational evangelistic ministry, a uh, multicultural. And so we have people from all nationalities and we are not a membership. We are a family and we are the family and followers of Jesus Christ. We believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we welcome you here. And once again, we want you to stay connected. We don't want you to just come one time just because you're passing through. We want you to come and join us in High Pat from Tennessee. Each, uh, each Wednesday, we're on at 1 o'clock p.m. And each Saturday morning, we give uh, Wednesdays, are, I call our advertisers to just prime you up for what's coming Saturday. And Saturday is our full service that we have at nine o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time, that's Chicago time that we have. And we're here every Saturday and we hear, hi Georgian from Tennessee. I uh, wanna welcome each of you here. Uh, I'm grateful my heart is elated, I'm overwhelmed when I can come here and see uh, of some you know, worshipers here and some of my followers here that would take time out on Wednesday to come and get the word of God. It's nothing like being fed the word of God throughout the, to the week to sustain you. So once again, I want to welcome you here. Let us know where you're from so that we can put, uh, can welcome you. And thank you for those who have joined me. Please share the message if you feel inspired by it to share. And, um, and so we'll move forward. So I'm going to jump right in. So I won't be here all day uh, on the message. But what I would like to know is, if you know, I believe that amidst the hustle and bustle of everyday living, because it is a hustle and bustle, each day is a gift from God. And if we stop and think about it, there's at least one thing for which we ought to be thankful. In addition, I believe that every day is a great day to be alive. No matter how bad we think we have it, there are any number of people who are on the other side, who if they could, will gladly change places with us. Hi, Sharon. There are people, we think we have a bad situation until we hear someone else's situation. So there are people on the other side, a number of people on the other side who, if they could, would gladly trade places with you. So if anything, we're thankful, Lord, for another day. We're thankful that we're alive, that we're breathing, that we're here to, to be in your presence, Lord. And so we're grateful and we're thankful for him. If I do nothing else, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so I, the question to me is, what is really going on in the house of the Lord? What is really going on in church? You know, sometimes I talk to people and I say, how was your Sunday service? Oh, well, you know, that that Sunday, you know, we have to go to church on Sunday. And it's nothing else. They don't go expecting anything. They don't go to gain anything, to, to, to grasp anything from the message or from meeting people. It's just a common thing that you do every Sunday. And we want it to be more than just a common thing. We, I want to go to meet Jesus there. And I want to go expecting something. And, uh, and so every Sunday, uh, so what is really going on in the house of the Lord? Uh, because once we go to the house of the Lord in fellowship, which we need to be in fellowship, once we leave out of those doors, it's time to go out and be about God's business. 
So every Sunday, countless people all over the world sit in church buildings with a false sense of security. They assume that their morality, their lifelong church membership or bat baptism will earn them a place in heaven. It's a lot of people think like that. While many of these folks sincerely desire to please God, they are confused about what the Christian life is all about. They think in terms of doing rather than being. What, what can I do to help instead of rather than being a saint and a Christian? It's what I can do. So they imitate the actions of good Christians going to a weekly service and praying and reading the Bible and trying to be decent people. However, salvation is not the product of good works. I have to share that with people often who think that just by doing good, they have earned their way to heaven. We come into the world with a corrupt nature and all of our wrongdoing is born of a heart turned away from the Lord because we are sinful people. We sin. It's that simple. The good news is that in the salvation experience, we are given a brand new nature. And that we can read about that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Our sin is wiped away because Jesus Christ did what he sacrificed himself for us. From the moment we trust in him, the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts so that we can live righteously. The Lord wants us to be righteous. The world values action. But the father prioritizes relationship, specifically a relationship with him. You often hear me talk about developing that intimacy with him. People who scurry about flaunting religiosity are missing out on the deeply satisfying and joyous intimacy between a believer and the Lord. We can help others. Uh, we can help turn others' tragic misunderstandings into triumph by being ready to explain why we have hope. And we can read that in 1 Peter 3.15. Speak of the personal relationship with Christ as possible when a person admits his need and trusts in the Savior. If your light shines, it reflects well on the church. But some of us don't know what to say. When people don't understand when they're lacking, or when they just, they're, they're, you know, they have tragic, tragic misunderstandings and, and, and they want to hear some good news to triumph and to know that they have hope. And, and, and we don't even know how to put to say. At one time or another, we have probably heard it. To pray effectively is to pray in the will of God. If we regard God as our source of the good and necessary things in life, as well as we should, James tells us there are two reasons we do not have the things we need. Ye have not, because ye ask not. You talked about it, but ye ask not. Ye ask. And receive not, because he asks amiss, that we may consume it upon your lusts. You're asking, but you got a motive behind it. You're asking, but you have an agenda. You're asking because you had lust in your heart. So you 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 don't receive. You ask, and you because some people say, "Well, I ask that I receive." What is your motive? Are you asking in the will of God, or in your will? In your way, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. And what does that mean? Because that ye may consume in upon your own heart. Yes, yes, Kevin, let us know where you're from. So the Bible expositor, Jim Gill states that to ask amiss is to ask not in the faith of a divine promise, nor with thankfulness for past mercies nor with submission to the will of God, nor with the right end to do good to others and to make use of what might be bestowed for the honor of God and the interest of Christ. To that end, some of us end our prayers with the words of Jesus, not my will, but thine be done. We can see that in Luke twenty-two forty-two. But just what exactly does that mean? The life of Jesus while he was on earth was a pattern of wanting to do only what God wanted to be done. Hi, Adele. Thank you for joining me on your lunch break. To his disciples, he affirmed, my meat, which is his purpose, is to do the will of God that sent me and to finish his work. That's in John 4, 32. In other words, his sole purpose was to do the will of God. We need to look at Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verses 5 and 10. And everything about him and his life lined up with that purpose. I'm going to say it again. Uh, 
to his disciples, he affirmed my meat, which is his purpose, is to do the will of, of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's in John 4, 32. In other words, his sole purpose was to do the will of God. See also Hebrews 10, 5 and 10 highly and everything about him and his life lined up with that purpose. Even when facing death by what was in the cruelest of methods, crucifixion, he yielded himself to the will of the father. Now we're going to fast forward over 2000 years later. And there you are in prayer. You have a laundry list of petitions of things you really want and or need. Do you trust your own judgment? Or do you trust God that what he wants for you transcends anything that you could ask or imagine for? Ephesians and 3.20. It is not easy to yield our will to that of the Father. Just ask Jesus. You can ask him. He had a struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane. His Gethsemane struggle was of such that there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as if they were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Read that in Luke 22, verses 43 and 44. Yet for those who desire to be in the nucleus of God's will, is there really any other way to pray? You may ask. The flesh that seeks to satisfy itself is constantly at war with the spirit that strives to do the will of God. Read Galatians 5, 17. The flesh always gets us in trouble. The enemy loves to deal with the flesh. Is there any other way to pray than in the will of God? The flesh that seeks to satisfy itself is constantly at war with the spirit that strives to do the will of God. Hi, Nicole from Minnesota. Some of God's finest statesmen of our time have said much on the issue of praying in the will of God. Pastor and author A.W. Tozer, some of y'all know him, puts it this way. Thank you for the hearts. To pray effectively, we must want what God wants. And, and, and that is only to pray in the will of God. Lord, your will, not mine. Lord, your way, not mine. You see, you're not drawn to God primarily for your own benefits, but for his. Evangelist R.A. Torre states, the chief purpose of prayer is that God may be glorified in the answer. And here we are thinking it is primarily about us and our needs. Isn't that something? When we pray, we think it's all about us and our needs and our wants. But the chief purpose of our prayer is that God may be glorified in the answer. We got to get an understanding. Not my will, but thine be done. Seven important words we need to bear in mind the next time we come to our Lord in prayer is while he can work all things for our good, Romans 8, 28, 29 say it is never about us. It is and must always be about him. His will done his way in our lives. We need to come to him and say, Lord, what do you want for me? I mentioned that before. What, Lord, what job do you want for me? What husband or wife do you want for me? What church do you want for me? What is it that you want from me, Lord, and for me? Because, Lord, it's all about glorifying you. It's all about exalting you in adoration. Lord, it's not my will and my want, but yours. And that's the attitude we need to take. We have Our Lord is a strong tower. The songs say, uh, uh, the Lord... He is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. So while we are inside the walls of the church, what's going on? Are we just sitting there every Sunday because that's something we're supposed to do? Go to church every Sunday and that's it. We get nothing. We go expecting nothing. We're missing the great, we're missing the point here. Our Lord does many things. We, our work once we go in and, and fellowship together and go fall at the altar and all of these things, we have to be sincere and submit ourselves so that when we go out, we can be disciples. In Proverbs 18, 10, Solomon wrote that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. What exactly does that mean? There's a little song that goes something like this. A friend wrote, um, uh, I know the person, actually they wrote it. <clears throat> And it says, um, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. 
The righteous run into it, and they are saved. And it's just a beautiful little little little, little song that we just sing and, and think about. The, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are saved. Thank you for the heart. What exactly does that mean? How is the name of the Lord a strong tower? What is a strong tower? To understand how the name of the Lord is a strong tower for us, today we break the verse into four parts. And we go deeper into it. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous are safety. It's in safety. What is the name of the Lord? A name is a powerful thing. Sometimes we can hear people name and we'll say, oh, do you know what your name means? I have a grandson. His name is Caleb. And I often tell him about Caleb. I have a grandson named Josiah. And I often tell them about the names and the meaning of the names. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And a name is, as I said, a powerful thing. This was more widely understood in ancient times than it is now. But it is still true nonetheless. A name carries the identity of the person name. It is who they are. In Proverbs 18.10, the word used for Lord is Yahweh. So it can be read the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. This is speaking of God's character, the entirety of who he is. Throughout the Bible, it refers to God himself as our strength. He's our rock. He's our fortress, etc. God and his name are one and the same. When you hear the name of someone, you know you have an inner vision of them because the name carries all that you know about them. This means that a name carries a person's reputation. Would you say, Pat, yeah, everything and everyone must bow to the name of our Lord. Because it says what? You can sing it with me. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. And we are safe when we run into that tower. When you hear the name, we can see how God's name or reputation preceded him in the book of Joshua. When God was leading Israel into the promised land, Joshua sent men into Jericho to spy out the land. Yes, we'll be praying for you, Kevin. Let us know where you're from. They were discovered and protected by a woman named Rahab who made this declaration to them. I'm going to say that again. We can see how God's name or reputation preceded him in the book of Joshua. When God was leading Israel into the promised land, Joshua sent men into Jericho to spy out the land. They were discovered and protected by a woman named Rahab who made this declaration to them. We have heard how the Lord dried up, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to say home in Og, the two kings of Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. That's in Joshua 2, 10, 11. By faith, Rahab tapped into the name of the Lord and she and all of her family were kept safe when the city of Jericho was destroyed. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. How is the name of the Lord a strong tower? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Some translations use terms such as fortified tower, strong fortress, mighty tower, tower of strength. And in one translation, it simply says great strength. A tower is something that is tall or high. The name of the Lord is high. He is high and mighty. As we exalt our highest, we often say he is high and mighty. Let them praise the name of the Lord because his name is high above all other names. His glory is above heaven and earth. That's in Psalms 148, 13. Come on, somebody tell me amen. So I know we all here together. The tower is strong. Strength is manifested in numerous ways. Words the dictionary used to convey how strength is covered are, thank you for the hearts. Uh, uh, words how the dictionary con uh, discover and um, convey how strength is, is, is physical, it's mental, it's competence, influence, it's moral power, effectiveness, healthy, means to resist attack, uncompromising, well supplied, clear and firm and thriving. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. It is high above your problems. Provides for all your needs. 
is above your problems. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And every time you think about the problems, all you have to do is say, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. You say that to yourself. It's very, very little simple. Hi, Safraz. And so you realize that the name of the Lord is a strong tower above my problems. He provides for all my needs. Thank you for the hearts. Who is righteous? There are two things here. The righteous, referring to the person and the action run. We say the righteous run do into it and they are safe. Who is the righteous? This Bible verse is talking about righteousness. According to the Bible is being in right standing with God. Are you, did you need to ask yourself today? Am I in right standing with God? You have to ask yourself that. Who is the righteous? This verse is talking about righteousness according to the Bible is, is those being in right standing with God. This is something no one can achieve on their own. For anyone to attain righteousness, they must receive it from God. You can't receive it by doing good. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You didn't save yourself by doing good. It is not by your good works so that no one can boast. That's in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because we want to brag about it. That's the one thing I love about humility and being humble. You can't brag. For, it, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? In Romans 5 and 17. What is the significance of the action run? Running is simply faster than walking. I'm running. You heard me. You heard me last week say David was running toward Goliath. He was running. He was, he was said, let me go and slay this giant. Let me go and take care of this problem. And so we're running. It's, we're moving faster than just walking. The woman at the well ran. She dropped the pot and ran to the city to tell the man I've, to tell the men of the city, I've met a man. For when you get excited about God and the Holy Spirit, you will run to tell the story of Jesus and his glory. So running is simply faster than walking. Thank you for the heart. However, the word used in the original text implies urgency. Urgency. You're running urgent. It's urgent that you're running. It is more accurately translated in rush. Or hurry, how it's written in this translation. I'm running, I'm hurrying to be about the business of God. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. A righteous person is rushing to it. And it is lifted above the danger. Can we feel safe in the strong tower? Yes, we can. What does it mean to be safe? The righteous run to it and they are safe. The verse above said, lift it up above the danger. You're safe. You're safe from these problems and from the enemy and all of this. So that because you count, because you called on the name of the Lord and you probably visualize I'm, I'm running to this big tower. You've called on the name of the Lord. He's a strong tower. You run to him and you are safe. But does it mean you lift it above the danger? The dictionary defines being safe as protected from or not exposed to danger or risk. Not likely to be harmed or lost. Other translation of the verse use words like you set on high and set safely on high and be safe and is safe and shall be exalted, be strengthened and are protected. Looking at the word in the original language, we get these phrases inaccessible, inaccessibly high, too high to capture and set on high far above evil that the enemy cannot touch you. In the verse that follows, Solomon identifies an imagined place of safety. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. That's in Proverbs 18, 11. Imagine safety isn't true safety. The name of the Lord is where true safety and protection are found. The name of the Lord is a strong tower when we are scared, when we are ill, when we are lost, when we are confused, when we are sad, when we are threatened, when we are weak, when we are overwhelmed, and when we are struggling financially, always the safety that the name of the Lord provides is multifaceted and trustworthy. No one of the righteous runs toward it. By faith, we can rush to the name of the Lord and find safety at any time. 
We can call on his name. The name of the Lord represents all that he is and has for us love and mercy and grace and power and righteousness and more. David called on the name of the Lord throughout his life and tasted the deliverance of God. And here are a few examples before I wrap up. From the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the towering rock of safety, for you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. That's what David prayed in Psalm 61, 2 and 3. Thank you for the heart. He said, hear me, O oh my God, as I voice my complaint, protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from the plots of the evildoers. That's in Psalm 64, 1 and 2. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. That's Psalms 59, 1 and 2. He said, the Lord is my protector. He is my strong fortress. My God is my protection and with him I am safe. He protects me like a shield. He defends me and keeps me safe. That's in Psalms 18 and 2. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high up on a rock. Psalm 27, 5. Call on the name of the Lord. Three times it is written that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We can see that in Joel 2:32. Acts 2, 21, and Romans 10 and 13. Psalms 91, the Lord protects us. He's our refuge. The shadow of the Almighty covers us. The, the name of the Lord, that's my message for today. I'm doing well. It's not quite 1.30. I'm on it today. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and they are saved. And we have to understand that the name of the Lord is a strong tower when we are scared to our wits. When we are ill, when things are affecting our health and our children, our marriage, our finances, when we are lost, when we are confused, when we are sad, when we are threatened, when we've experienced the loss of a loved one, when we are weak, when we are overwhelmed, and we can get overwhelmed and exhausted and then exhausted. We can, get, we can get exhausted for things and be overwhelmed with things. And even when we are struggling financially, always remember that the safety that the name of the Lord provides is multifaceted and trustworthy. And that's the tower you run to. So it says, no wonder the righteous rush toward it by faith. We can rush to the name of the Lord and find safety at any time. Yes, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And I, and I, I, I often, that's why I just, that little, that little one line, I just love to sing. When I come against things, I just think about the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. And you can sing this and know that when you run into the world, run into that tower, run into the safe place, the safe place is not that you say, well, I got to find a tower to run to. Running to God is the strong tower. You run fast and you run whatever you're coming against. You immediately go and call on the name of the Lord. It's urgent that you call on him because you're having problems and you got these mountains and all these things are surrounding you. The worry, the illness, the loss, the confused, the sadness, the threat and the weak and the overwhelm and struggling financially and the marriage and all of these things. Your spiritual journey, everything. That's urgent. And you run to him. And you call on him, Yahweh. Jehovah God. Lord, I, I, I'm running. The woman at the well ran. David ran toward Goliath to take him down. I'm going to get rid of this problem. Yes. Yes. So today is 1.30. And that's my message for today. Remember that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run. Know that you're righteous. You've got to, if you've got to renew your vow with him, you've you got to get it right. And when you go inside the walls of the church, don't just go every Sunday just to go and sit and go because there's something you do every Sunday. You go with expectancy. You go to call and cry on the Lord that you know is a strong tower. You go to help someone else. You go to be the salt of the earth. 
And when you come outside the wall, you just don't, you just don't stop it there. You really be effective when you come outside and you be the salt and you teach others how to call on the Lord who is a strong tower. So I want to thank each of you again for joining me today, for being a part of, uh, of the message today. My just passing through. If you're here for the first time, let us know who you are and, um, uh, and where you're from. Come back and join us on uh, Saturday at 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, share this message with someone that needs to hear it. Invite people to come and be a part of our family, of what we do here every Wednesday and every Saturday, because we need him. We need him. And stay connected with us. Uh, 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 stay connected with us Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, our YouTube. Go to our YouTube channel and sign up. And then if I have people on here who want to give, we got ways for you to give. I don't even usually mention that on Wednesday. But if you want to give to help our ministry so that we can help others, please consider sowing into our ministry. We have four ways that you can help give. It's here on our page. Geraldine is listing it. Sign up for your prayer request. Go to our website, www.thewordwithjpolson.com. It's on here. Send us your prayer request. Sign up for my inspiration readings that go out every Monday. And be a part of who we are. I love each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat from Tennessee and Lee from Ghana. And uh, Kevin, I don't, I'm not sure where Kevin is from. Uh, Dale from Boston, Massachusetts area. And Merlin from Tennessee. And, and we have the different ones. Devon from Tennessee. And, and those who join me. Nicole from Minnesota. Um, someone needed prayer. Surprise. We're praying for surprise. And um, let's see who else. I have some other people that were on. I don't want to miss you. Sharon from Wisconsin. We want to, we bless each of you. Want to make sure I'm getting all the names in. If I miss your name, please forgive me. Um, for those who have joined me today, uh, I may not be able to see you, uh, but I'm just calling out your name. If I don't see you, we'll make sure we acknowledge you when we list those who came to the message, to hear the message today. Yes. I'm, kind of, I'm going through the list now to make sure if I miss anyone that I can uh, make sure I get the names on. Thank you for the hearts. I love the hearts. I think I called Sharon. Thank you, Georgian from Eastern Tennessee up near Nashville area. Wendy from South Africa. Thank you, Wendy. Devon. Yes, thank you, Geraldine. And those of you who I may not have seen, I may have missed, um, God loves you, and I love you too. It's 133. Gosh, we're doing great today. And once again, share the message if you feel someone should hear it. And we need the Lord every day. Yes, yes. Thank you, Marilyn. Blessings to you. Uh, uh, blessings to others who may be on it. I did not. We miss some names every week because we don't really see the names until afterwards. So I want you to know that we thank you for being here. Uh, I want to see each of you on Saturday. I pray that this message bless your heart today. I pray that you were able to get something from the message today. That little song that I sing, I want you to, to get it in your heart and sing it. Bless you again. God loves you. I do too. Be blessed throughout the week, the week, and I will see you on Saturday. Goodbye.